It's not like any Shauna person would choose to eat sadza over a big juicy impala. They just wouldn't, right? If you get, if you put, if you're like, hey, steak or sadza, they're taking steak a hundred percent of the time. On this week's podcast, I had the great pleasure of talking to Forrest Gallant. He's essentially, as I say in the podcast, a combination of Indiana Jones and the next Steve Irwin. He's a really, really cool guy, and he's a wildlife biologist doing all kinds of amazing adventures. We talk about his wildlife biology adventures, chasing down tiger sharks and venomous sea snakes, walking sharks, this kind of thing, ending up in grave sites for indigenous people in Papua New Guinea. And then we get into a really interesting discussion of the indigenous people that he's come in contact with along the way of tracking down all these unique, exotic, sometimes endangered, rare animals. I wanted to get Forrest's perspective on the anthropology piece. I've been to see the Hadza and the Datoga and other African tribes. Forrest has been to see those tribes as well. We also talk about his experiences with a very remote tribe in Colombia, some Papua New Guinea tribes, and many others. His perspective is unique based on his travels. And wouldn't you know it, well, I won't spoil it completely. I'll let you listen to the podcast, but I don't think many of these tribes are so keen on vegetables and they're pretty keen on meat and organs. So enjoy this podcast with Forrest Gallant, and I hope to be able to do some adventures in person with him really soon. Forrest, thanks for coming on the podcast, man. It's good to have you here. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is great. I'm excited to talk to you about all kinds of things. I think that, um, I always think that when people get asked, like, what do you do? It's a boring question. So I thought we'd start with, I'd love for you to, to talk to the listeners about this upcoming expedition you've got going on. Because in the process of telling this story, they'll get a sense of what you do in the world. And I think that'll be a good jumping off point. So, you know, we're recording this and you're leaving, you know, soon to do some cool expeditions. And let's just start with what you're doing in the next few weeks and we'll go from there. Yeah, with pleasure. So on, uh, on the 15th, so in about two weeks, or not even now, I take off back to back um, until mid-April. And uh, first off, I will be headed to South Africa to look for and study the endemic small species of sharks that occur in South Africa. Because South Africa is a country where two oceans meet, uh, the Indian Ocean and the Antarctic, or the Atlantic, really, um, and where it happens to be in the world in, in nearing Antarctica, it has incredibly high levels of endemism in the ocean, meaning a species that occur nowhere else in the world. So we're heading there to look into some of these more alien species, species of sharks that are not well known to the rest of the world and have pretty much morphological superpowers. And I'll be there for, uh, for about three and a half weeks. And then from there, I head to somewhere that's been at the top of my bucket list forever, Nigaloo Reef, uh, Exmouth area, Western Australia, to study the relationship between tiger sharks and sea snakes and how sea snake venom can potentially affect tiger shark tissue if it happens to be injected. Um, so yeah, two, di two different studies back to back over the next couple months, that'll be a blast. So what are these magical powered sharks in South Africa? <laughs> like, uh, yeah, well, I mean, you know, magical might be a bit of a stretch, but there's just, there's all kinds of incredible behaviors and things like that uh, because there's such high uh, amounts of predators and such uh, interesting diversity. These sharks have developed incredible sort of superpowers in order to combat you know, big predators and abundantly weird prey. And so certain things like shy sharks, which is a little species of sharks that'll roll into a ball and cover its eyes with its fins in order to protect its eyes from being pecked out by, uh, by a predator. Um, and then some of the deep water sharks, like goblin sharks that can actually have an accordion jaw so they can throw their jaw out from their mouth to catch prey and then suck it back in. Um, and the list goes on and on, you know, big seven gills, that uh, are super slow moving, but have uh, somehow evolved the ability to capture and eat sea lions. Uh, and they've been hammered by the orcas and they have to dodge great whites. And the list sort of goes on and on. They're just amazing, the, the adaptions that these animals have learned over millions of years. It, the ocean is so amazing. What's under the ocean is just so, so, so cool. And when you were telling me, we, we were catching up via the phone the other day, and you were telling me about this this project with the sea snakes. This is this is a venomous sea snake. You were saying it has a neurotoxin and a cytotoxin, right? Right. Yep. And right. that and that when it bites its prey, it's just this like KGB killer. It leaves no trace. Exactly. Yep. And yeah, like so. And I was saying, what could go wrong? You have a sea snake and a tiger <laughs> shark. Like, so tell a little. Yeah. yeah. Like so tell so tell a little more of the story of the, of like the the collision of like like this, like all the ways to die. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> 
Well, I mean, you know, the IP belongs to to Discovery Channel because this is all for Shark Week, so I have to watch what I say, but until the show comes out. But basically, oh. as it's okay, I'm not worried about it. As you mentioned, um, you know, these sea snakes have this cocktail of venom that is pretty much untraceable. You know, you, people might have seen this on the internet before. You take a drop of like rattlesnake venom and put it in blood, and all of a sudden the blood turns to jello, right? Well, the sea snake, the cocktail of venom that the sea snake has is untraceable. It doesn't do that. What it does is it has a tiny little protein that binds onto the receptors that tell the cells what to do. And that protein dissolves and disappears shortly after the animal dies. So basically, you have this big giant animal, whatever it happens to be, a, a fish, a shark, a marine mammal, whatever it is, a human. And if the snake, a sea snake bites you, that protein receptor or that protein goes in and stops the binding agent. And so basically your organs just shut down. So you'll just be cruising along, swimming along, whatever it happens to be. And all of a sudden you asphyxiate to death, your heart stops pumping and you just sort of roll over dead in an incredibly painful way. And then, um, and then that's untraceable. And so because nobody's really looked at those effects on certain species of sharks, that's what my team and I are headed to do. So as far as the dangers, I mean, we have to, attempt to capture as many sea snakes as possible, milk venom from them, and then take tissue samples from various species of sharks. And, and then under an electron microscope, because of the scale of mentioning how those proteins bind to those cells, we have to then take that um, venom and mix it with the cells and the tissue samples and see how it responds. So it'll be, it'll be fun. And, you know, look, I'm not the cellular scientist. I'm the hands-on guy. So I'm the guy that catches the snakes and gets the tiger shark tissue sample so uh you know there's a guy named brian fry who's doing the venom work but i'm the uh i'm the i'm the go get them guy i gotta go out and get those samples which will be really fun so you're the guy who's catching venomous sea snakes yep and then what are you catching by the tail no 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 that would definitely bite you if you do that so with sea snakes it depends on the species like olives are more placid than others and blah 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 but um you basically have to you're you're free diving so you spot them you're free diving and then you have to scoop them up in a net or something like that, and then move them onto a rocking boat, grab them behind the head without them reaching back and biting into your hand, because one drop and you're done. And then, um, you know, when people have seen snakes get milked in the past, you've probably seen the fangs come, you know, up and over. Sea snakes don't have fangs like that. They have small razor sharp teeth. So you have to actually pry their mouths open and take a pipette and reach into the venom glands at the base of the teeth and suck up little spurts of venom. And we have to do that over and over and over in order to get enough venom to test. Then we have to take tissue samples from sharks without hurting the sharks. So we don't fish for them because that's not something we believe in supporting. So instead, we have to dive in the water with biopsy spears, chum the sharks in, and then take these biopsy samples from the living animal um, you know, while we're in the water with them. So yeah, it can be, it can be a little bit of a dance at times. <laughs> Again, what could go wrong? What could yeah, go wrong? Exactly. <laughs> what could go wrong? So if people haven't figured it out by now, you're like, I mean, I think of you, I, I'm sure people have given you these monikers before. You seem to me to be this cross between Indiana Jones and like the late Steve Irwin, right? I mean, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I've heard that before. I mean, I just think of myself as, you know, a wildlife biologist who loves communicating like a passion for conservation, but um, I'm very, very hands-on, you know, in my, in my earlier career as an academic, as a biologist, I spent a lot of time in the lab and and doing like very boring field surveys and i just can't do that any longer like i have to do i, I guess i'm a little bit of an adrenaline junkie so yeah i'm very hands-on i i do a lot of hide and seek if you will looking for lost species and animals that have major human wildlife conflict components and uh yeah just spend a lot of time on the road uh, 2019 i spent 300 nights in a tent so you know it just depends on the year but uh it's uh, it's all over the place and so one of the interesting things about what you do is that in this process of looking for all these animals, you've come in contact with indigenous people all over the globe that, I mean, from what I've seen from your Instagram content and your videos are, are sort of like helping you in your search saying, where can I find this shark? And you know, where can I find this snake? And so this was, this is a really interesting aspect of your experience that I thought the audience would be, would be fascinated by, because as, as you and I were talking about, anthropology is so interesting and what people all over the world eat and how they yeah. live is, is such a good framework. And when we were talking on the phone, I was telling you that I wish this were taught in medical school, this idea right. that, you know, you're taught, I was taught in medical school. There's all these diseases that humans get 
And they're just really a bad, they're bad poker hand. There's no way you can really get rid of them. Thank God that we have pharmaceutical companies who are all well-intentioned and, and they make these amazing drugs, which have a few side effects, but nothing major. Obviously, yeah. I'm being facetious here. And these, <laughs> these pharmaceutical drugs are fire from the gods here to help us from these unescapable genetic medical issues. Yeah. And the narrative that I've discovered since graduating from medical school, um, and I, I spent time with the Hads, but you spend time with so many peoples, was that there are, there are literally hundreds, if not thousands of cultures of humans all over the world that don't eat Ho-Hos and Twinkies and Coca-Cola and Pepsi or even bread, you know, uh, or, or any of these processed foods that we eat as humans. And they also, this might be connected, but we can't prove it for sure. They also seem to enjoy pretty darn good health yeah. from what I've read and seen it with the Hadza and some of the African tribes. And they don't seem to have chronic disease and they seem to live a pretty good long life with a lot of vitality. So whenever I can talk to someone like you, who's actually been to many of these people, it's super fascinating for me. So I think let's just, let's dive into that. Um, uh, I'm trying to think, I mean, you can lead the discussion wherever you'd like in terms of these people, but you and I were talking, maybe we want to talk about this, this, this uncontacted or this, this, to start with this remote group of people in Colombia that you were telling yeah. me about. And um, and so I think that the, the, the first question I have for you is, you know, how did you get to see these people, which is a great story, and then what do they eat? And then we'll talk a little bit about their health. Yeah, with pleasure. Well, just to paint the picture a little bit further, you know, in, in our quest for wildlife work, which is exclusively pretty much what I do is traveling the world to do this, this sort of high risk wildlife work. We have to absolutely depend on local knowledge and resources. Like there's no, you know, I know more, <clears throat> excuse me, I know more than they do. I'm going to like rush in there and get it done. That's not at all how this job works. You know, we get there and we spend weeks talking to people on the ground, like where did you see it? How did it interact? So on and so forth. And so we're very, very dependent on some of these primitive peoples and the, well, not just primitive peoples, but these local peoples. Um, and, and their knowledge base. And because of that, we have to abide by their customs, you know, many, many times. And the reason I bring that up is because that includes their hospitality, their way of eating, their lifestyle, and embedding with them and their methodology in order to succeed at what we want to do. So I'm very fortunate in the sense of I've gotten to travel all around the world, work with these groups of people, and most of the time sleep on the floor of a mud hut, hang out with them, be in a hammock, live in a canoe with them, whatever it happens to be for extended periods of time. And I've been lucky enough to witness so much, you know, not just from a dietary standpoint, but from a culturally significant standpoint. Anyway, all that is to say, in 2019, uh, when we were working in the, Am uh, yeah, 2019 on this one, working in the Colombian Amazon, we had to get to this incredibly remote region of the Rio Apaporis, which is a drainage of the Amazon that has been under FARC controlled, FARC rebel controlled, uh, I guess, govern, if you will, guerrilla warfare is what it really is for the last 35 years. And thus, no Western people have been in there for 35 years. And so, you know, the FARC rebel thing sort of died down in 2018 due to Colombian government putting a crackdown on it. And so things were, quote, at peace. However, they really weren't. And so we said, let's go in there. Let's look for this lost crocodilian. And in doing that, the only way we found out to get into this tribal area, and I'm blanking on the tribe's name, they're fantastic people, I'll, I'll send you some pictures. Um, we had to find uh, an airplane that would fly three and a half hours over the Amazon to a strip. Now, Paul, you might ask yourself, why would there be a cargo airplane flying into a perfectly manicured strip in the middle of the Colombian Amazon? Um, yeah, and if, if, if the listeners aren't figuring this out, it's because it was a cocaine running airplane. And that's what they did. They flew coke in and out of the Amazon into, um, you know, the, a town that I won't say in Colombia and distributed it from there. Not our problem. We just needed to charter the plane and get in there. And I will say that this tribe, uh, they're uncontacted in the sense of, well, they're not uncontacted. They're just, they remain in their ways in the sense of they're about a four day canoe ride, motor canoe from the next nearest village. They were a three and a half hour plane ride from a major town in Colombia, and that plane only went in under the cover of darkness here and there for nefarious activities. And so when we found a, uh, a pilot that was ballsy enough to say, sure, you can charter the plane and land on the strip, 
we went into this community of about uh, probably about 70 or so people um, that primarily grew coca leaf and were FARC rebel controlled. Um, but outside of that, they made their living exclusively on the jungle. So they ate fish. They had shaman rituals. Um, they, they hunted for fruit and grew fruit in their community. Um, you know, they had a little bit of like corrugated tin and things like that that people had brought over the years. But outside of that, it was all raw materials. They, the shaman gathered in a maloka, which was a traditional hut. Um, they actually blew crap up my nose from this thing, which was a snail. This is a monkey bone, that's beeswax, and that's a snail shell. And this is a plug. And they keep all their interesting powders and whatnot in there. And you have to do a whole cleansing ritual. And I puke my brains out all night. <laughs> and um, they're a very happy, very lovely group of people that we got to spend uh, two and a half, three weeks with. Um, and it was, it was very, very enjoyable, minus the puking. So, they, so this is basically, they're mostly uncontacted by Westerners, by Western society. They're living off the land almost entirely. Yep. And, um, and so you said that they get most of their protein from fish. They're fishing yep. and they're mostly fishing for piranha, right? So they're Correct. eating fish. Correct. And then they're eating fruit. Do they, do, do they gather honey at all? Do they have any honey in that region of the world? Uh, that's a good question. You know, I'm not sure. I didn't experience any honey, but yeah, they're so, I mean, they hunt as well. You know, they get, they get uh, little pig, well, not pigs, but you know, peccary and agoutis and things like that. They right. hunt, but the pr primarily they're getting fish to eat. It's mostly piranha, a little bit of catfish, a little bit of peacock bass and arapaima and things like that. But it's, it's a lot of piranha. Like you can put a hook in the water with meat anywhere and pull out a nice piranha. And so, yeah, so most of their protein is coming from that. They didn't, from what I saw, have any grain or vegetable crops at all. I didn't see them eating any vein, grain or vegetable crops. Like most of our meals with them was a big old thing of boiled or roasted piranha, a bunch of plantains, some papaya. Um, and then they did have chickens, but we didn't eat any chicken ever, unfortunately, because we were very tired of boiled piranha. But um, <laughs> we... Uh, we, we, do, we did eat eggs, you know, so they had chickens for the eggs. And I'm sure those chickens had been brought in, you know, they, yeah. they weren't uncontacted. And I want to be clear on that. They were, they were removed enough that they had their own language, that only a, a, their language, which I can't recall, to Spanish translator could speak. And then he also happened to speak English. So it was like three steps in order to communicate mm -hmm. with them. Um, and the only people, the only influence they had were from basically these Spanish Coke dealers that would come in and out of, uh, out of, you know, capital areas of Colombia to, to get trade with them and give them things. And because of that, they had, like I said, they had t-shirts, they had corrugated tin. Um, they ha allegedly had a generator that never worked once, but, um, you know, they had a few things that had been brought in by this, this plane that came every now and then. But other than that, they lived exclusively off of the land and, and off their own crops and, the things they were able to hunt and it was uh it was lovely so not a lot of vegetables these people no. they weren't they weren't making salads and eating kale and spinach and definitely not no yeah you know i think they did have a root a root crop of some kind just thinking back it might have been a taro or something like that yeah but in the three weeks we were with them we never had it we we literally just ate meat or and by meat i mean fish and and fruits and that part was great by the way i think we all lost weight on that trip but uh yeah no it was uh you know and the fruit was incredible like the the mangoes and the plantains and things like that was so delectable and quite honestly the fish was great too it was just a lot of fish all day every day <laughs> so if you jumped in the river with those piranhas like eat you because i've never been in a river with piranhas but i'm super curious about this no, they don't. I mean, we were we bathed in the river every night and stuff like that. And I've spent a lot of time around piranhas and in the Amazon. The only time that would happen, like if you had an open wound, I would not recommend getting in that water for a number of reasons. But one of them being that uh, piranhas clue on to that and then they can go pretty nuts. But uh, but no, it's not like the cartoons where the piranhas just come and like rip you to shreds. That only happens yeah. in very, very uh, interesting circumstances where Basically, the Amazon floods every year, right, because of all the rains. And then when the water recedes, groups of schools of piranhas get caught in little puddles. And once they're done eating everything in that puddle, all the turtles and other fish and even even crocodilians and snakes and things, then they become desperate. And that's when, 
some of these images that have circulated on the internet, like the cow that goes walking into the puddle and gets stripped to the bone, that's when piranha become like that. It's very situational. This cured my two-year-old's allergies and ear infection issues. Check out this review on histamine and immune from Heart and Soil Supplements. I purchased histamine and immune for my two-year-old son. He was suffering from the horrible Austin, Texas allergies, would get constant ear infections. After two days of mixing the capsules into his yogurt or eggs in the morning, his allergies and congestion cleared. He is the happiest and healthiest I have ever seen him. No more Benadryl, no more antibiotics. I've also been introducing kefir and a little pan-seared liver with honey into his diet, and his microbiome is steadily healing after the past year of antibiotic regimens. He's living the radical life we all deserve. Thank you, Dr. Paul, and everyone at Heart and Soil for all you do. Keep fighting the good fight. Histamine and immune is probably my favorite supplement that we make at Heart and Soil that I don't talk about enough. Thymus is incredible. Thymus is an organ where your T cells mature, especially in childhood and adolescence, but even throughout your whole life, your T cells are maturing and being adjusted in your thymus, a gland that lives behind your sternum. And there's good evidence that thymic extracts, including thymomodulin, decrease respiratory tract infections in kids when they are given. Organs are powerful, and they really do support the corresponding organ in the human body. Stay tuned, I've got much more interesting research about the like versus like idea with organs, but it's powerful, and there is good science to support the concept. If you or anyone you know has histamine issues, immune issues, get thymus. The easiest way to do that is getting histamine and immune from heart and soil. Our mission is to help you reclaim your birthright to radical and optimal health heartandsoil.co, and you can give Heart and Soil a follow at Heart and Soil Supplements on the socials, including the gram. Yeah, interesting. So with this group in Colombia, they, they probably don't know how old they are, but there's this, I don't know why people believe this, but there's this idea that, quote, primitive, which is absolutely a mis misconception, but like, right. you know, that ancestral or indigenous humans live short lives, and it's often repeated, and I think that it's mostly false. But I'm just curious, any, any sense of the oldest people in this tribe? Did they all die at 35? You know, or is the life expectancy there 35? Definitely not. But I would also, on the flip side of that, say that there were no 95-year-olds. You, know? okay. so you know, from what we saw, there were a couple very old people. There was one old woman who, man, I don't know, maybe 80-ish, late 80s. But it's just so hard to tell. You know, they're their skin is much firmer than ours. And like their complexion is not green or unhealthy. It's a healthier looking complexion. But at the same time, her hair is super gray and her teeth are, you know, very old. And so you could tell that she was an older woman, but she could have been 55 or 105. And I really don't know. So it's, it's so really hard. hard to say. Yeah, it really is. And they don't know either. You know, there was no sort of birthdays and Christmases and things like that d didn't exist in that village. I mean, maybe birthdays did, but we certainly didn't hear about any. Were there, were there any tribe members that were obese? Oh God, no, 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 no. They're all very lean. And especially, you know, I actually grew up in Africa. I grew up in Zimbabwe. Um, and those people that eat and live like this, whether it's a, a matter of, of lack of calories or just the lifestyle or whatever, they're the opposite. Everybody's yoked, you know, <laughs> everybody's got a six pack whether you're skinny with a six pack or you just or have a lot of muscle, like there's no such thing as obesity. There's not even overweightness. Like that doesn't exist. In fact, I would go out on a limb to say we cause the most damage because, and we always do this, we bring a big bag of Jolly Ranchers everywhere we go. There's, <laughs> there's, I know you're going to hate this. Your listeners are going to hate this, but you cannot, there is no better way to win over people than a bag of Jolly Ranchers where they've never had refined sugar and you can hand out refined sugar to a group of children. Keep in mind, it's like a handful. They're not living yeah, yeah, on it, right? It's like a one-time yeah. treat. And then all the kids are smiling ear to ear and then everybody loves you immediately. So yeah, we're, we're, we probably cause the most harm. <laughs> but you know, you know, Forrest, obesity is genetic. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, right. playing on a recent, right. recent meme that's happening on social media. Obesity it. is genetic and, you know, 50 to 85% of obesity is genetic and it's unavoidable. So unavoidable. Yeah. yeah <laughs> I just, so here's, you, you know, Paul, at some point in time, cause I, I own a production company. We create TV shows. I will create a biggest loser type show where all we do is take people like that, that say that these things are genetic and unavoidable and stick them in a village in the Amazon or Africa or, or Myanmar or Papua New Guinea. And that, that unavoidable genetics will disappear very, very quickly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. And, you know, I, 
I did some content about this with the the Pima Indians. You know, I went to medical school in Arizona, uh-huh. and I don't know if you're familiar with the Pima Indians. They they are they have the highest some of the highest rates of obesity and concomitant diabetes in the world okay. right now. But 200 years ago, if you search pictures, and we can put up pictures on the on the YouTube video of 200 years ago or even 150 years ago, Pima Indians, they're lean. They're yeah. you know the genetics haven't changed. This population is really insulated. So they're not really, you know, mixing genetics with Westerners or people who are not Native American or not Pima, but you can have the exact same lineage of Pima Indians who 150 years ago were eating. I mean, I don't know what they eat in the desert Southwest exactly. We could, we could define the Pima Indian diet. I suspect it's, it's some tubers. It's probably seasonal fruit. It's probably, uh, you know, some cacti fruit. It's probably honey when they can find it and meat that they're hunting. And then, Flip that, you know, within a few generations, they start eating fry bread, cooked in seed oils. And this is all just association. We can't draw causative inference, but something is going on here. And they eat, they eat less meat and they, they, like I said, way more seed oils and less butter or less animal fat. And they become massively obese and sadly, severely diseased with diabetes. So there's, this is a really interesting sort of continuation of the same lineage of genetics without really um, any changes. And I just, I love this idea of like the real biggest loser show, like just right. change your diet. So yeah. And just stick them out in one of these places where there is no option. You know, it's like, I'm the same, right? I, like I'm not nearly as strict as you, or I'm sure many of your listeners, like if I see an Oreo and I haven't had a treat in a week, I'm going to have an Oreo, right? I'm not going to eat a sleeve of Oreos because I'm not, not a pig, but I will have an Oreo, you know, you, there's no Oreos when you're in the Amazon, you know? And so it's like, even if you just have a cut two Oreos a week, that adds up. Right. And so when you're out there with one of these groups or tribes, and we go through this all the time, I'm, I'm the heaviest I've been in six months now because the holiday season and blah, 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 you know, and I eat and I enjoy myself and all of that. I'm about to leave on these expeditions. That'll, that'll drops off in no time. And it's because those, those options aren't there, you know, and, and further to that, and this actually goes back to your Pima, Pima Indian conversation, the lifestyle changes. Like we're up at dawn every day. We're out in the sun. Half the time we're sunburnt, which isn't the best thing. But, you know, we're out in the sun every day. Uh, wind on your face. You're exposed to the elements. You're getting cold. You're getting hot. You know, there's no this. Like I'm never sitting in my comfortable office with the air conditioner on, you know, with the false light overhead. You know, like this doesn't happen once when we're on an expedition. Not not for months, you know, like the most comfortable we get is when you get back on the plane to go home and you're sitting in your shitty coach seat going, Oh, what a relax, you know, <laughs> and it's like that's as comfortable as you get for a couple months. And uh, to go back to your Pima India thing, I could be wrong. In fact, I'm tr- certain I'm wrong. I don't know if it's the Pima Indians or what tribe it was, but another compounding thing may be the fact that some of those, those Indian tribes, those Native American tribes used to be pursuit hunters, right? And they would run down prey over 50, 100, 150 miles until those deer would become so exhausted they'd collapse. Now, I'm guessing, and I could be wrong, but I'm guessing there's not a lot of Pima Indians that are still doing 100 miles to chase a deer on foot anymore. No. And, you know, you combine that with the junk food that's available, and it's like, it's a recipe for disaster. Have you been to see the, we talked about this a little bit, but I forget, the Kung San in Botswana, Namibia, South Africa. Have you been to those people? Yeah, I have. I've, I've seen the Khoisan. Uh, I know a little bit about the Sun people in general. I certainly can't speak any cause of, but um, it's, uh, you know, they're, they're fascinating people, especially the nomadic varieties um, in the Kalahari and the way that they move around based on migrations and foods. And um, yeah, I grew up in Zimbabwe, so we had Shauna and Zulu and some other cultures nearer to us, but I have seen them, you know, in a limited capacity. Fascinating yeah. people. Yeah. And when we were talking... Um... I really want to go visit the, the Khoisan. Um, I've never seen a, a picture of an obese San tribesman either. When we were talking on the phone, you were, because I was asking, you know, if I really wanted to go visit remote people, you also mentioned Papua New Guinea. So yeah. maybe we can talk about your experiences there. And I know the people in Papua New Guinea have some agriculture that's become part of their, their, um, their society. But what's, what's it, what are the people from an anthropology perspective, you know, what are these Pap- Papua New Guineans like? <laughs> Yeah, well, so Papua New Guinea is really interesting, right? There's 800 languages spoken in a single country. What? So, yeah, what? 800 languages. So that means there's 800 cliques, tribes, groups that are basically constantly at war or conflict with each other. Wow. So it shows you how insular they are, right? And a big part of that is just 
how incredibly impenetrable the jungle is and, and the geography of the place. So, you know, when you go to an easy place where everybody can communicate and walk to each other and go down a river, you don't get 800 different languages, right? That happens because a group of people settle in an area and it's, it's just far too difficult to co-mingle with other groups. Um, and so, you know, when I, when I mentioned like what I've done in Papua New Guinea, keep in mind, I've met with maybe three of those groups of the 800. So my sample size is minute, but, sure. um, the groups that we've been with, uh, man, it all like blends together. Uh, Tufi area. I remember the name of the area is Tufi, uh, Papua New Guinea. And some of the tribes that we've seen there, uh, they're, they're not uncontacted to be clear. They just choose to live in their room, in their lifestyle. They haven't wanted to adopt, you know, missionaries and Western lifestyle and Western culture. And, you know, that doesn't mean that they're all in grass skirts. Some of them are wearing t-shirts and things like that, but they're still sticking to traditional medicine, traditional hunter gatherer, traditional foraging for the most part, some cultivation of fruits and crops, but very seasonal and very limited. And again, like most of these island nations, like most of the world, their primary source of protein comes from fish, it comes from freshwater or saltwater fishing. Now, this obviously, I'm not talking about groups in the in the, the cloud forest and high mountains, right? I'm talking about the groups that I worked with, which were close to the ocean. And um, they're interesting. And part of this is definitely cultural and not not based on diet or resources, but they're very aggressive. They're very welcoming and warm. I want to be clear about that in the right circumstance. Because outside of that, these are warring peoples. They still go to war with each other. Contrary to what popular uh, literature will tell you, there are still there is still active cannibalism taking place. Oh. Um, and it, yeah, and it's it's absolutely fascinating. You know, our situation was amazing. We got told, hey, there's a tribe up this particular river drainage that lives up there far outside of town, and they don't want to have anything to do with town. And they're the ones who have this particular connection with the ocean. We were looking for epaulets, which is a species of walking shark, and they'll know where to find them. And we're like, all right, let's grab some canoes and head up there. And everybody was like, oh, no, don't do that. Don't do that. And I was like, well, we're going to do it anyway. So we grabbed <laughs> canoes, paddled up this river, reached a dead end. And didn't, the only sign of people we saw was that a few things had been chopped. Like you could tell some stuff had been cut. No plastic pollution, no garbage, no fire pits, no huts, nothing. And we got to this waterfall and we're like, oh, wow, this is the dead end. And then we saw a human skull and we're like, oh, interesting. What is that human skull? And we climbed into this cavern and there was a cavern about the size of my office. I'm sitting in filled with human skulls and it was a burial site. And my one cameraman, Mitch, is like, dude, we got to get the fuck out of here. He's like freaking out. And I was like, all right, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. I was freaking out, too, but I'm blaming it on him. And uh, and so we like backed out of this this burial area, the same entrance we had come in. And there were five warriors surrounding us holding spears. And they had been tracking us since we had come up the, uh, come up the estuary. And they, we'd never seen them once. And this is what I do for a living is spotting things that are abnormalities in nature. And they tracked us the whole time and watched us go in and everything. And um, because they weren't uncontacted, a few of them spoke English. One of them's name was Moses because they had had missionaries come through there and they had had missionaries in the past and stuff. And so the, the tribal chief spoke English and he was like, what are you doing here? You're like very aggressive in the beginning. And I was like, we've come here to talk about sharks. Like we're not here to, we don't want, we don't have any religious things to push on you. We don't have, we don't, we're not asking for anything. We're just come to talk about sharks. And they're like, okay, come sit down. You know? And then it was like, all good. But it was very, very tense for a little bit and very, very interesting. Now this, I saw this on your Instagram. Maybe we can use some of your photos if it's okay with you. There was actually a guy that you were talking to um, there's a, there's a reel on your Instagram of you actually finding the cave and it was really cool. You were like, Oh shit, we got to get out of here. Yeah. And then there's, yeah. it, there, there was a guy who had this headdress of a shark. It was really kind of cool. Yeah. Was this that tribe, right? The walking shark Correct. tribe. Like, Correct. He, yep. like, so what was going on there? He has this, like, I don't know. It's not a hat. It's not a helmet. It's just this traditional yeah. head dressing. That's actually the mouth of a shark. Yeah. So his uh, blanking on his name right now, but he was like, what I learned from this tribe, and I'll, I'll get their name. I'm sorry, I sound so ignorant blanking on it, but I'll get the name of the tribe. Like I said, there's 800 plus of them, so it's hard to keep track. But this guy, whose name I'm also forgetting, he was the fisherman. And so from what I learned with my short time with this tribe, 
there was like a head chief when it came to singing and dancing. There was a there was a head person when it came to hunting. There was a warrior trainer who took the boys at age seven and taught them to be warriors. And so there was everybody had like an assignment as to what sort of their thing was, how they got that, whether they were assigned it or, or they developed it. I really don't know. But this guy was the head fisherman. Like he was the chief of fishing within the community. And so he wore these shark jaws that wrapped around his face. And they didn't like, wasn't a helmet. It didn't go under his chin. It was sort of just decoration. And it was, a you know, above his brow and below his mouth. And that was, and it, you know, tied behind his ears. And that was his symbol of being the lead fisherman. And so he had the special connection, not just with fishing, but with the ocean and the, the creatures that inhabit it, and specifically with sharks, because that's something he has to deal with on a daily basis. And so, yeah, he was, uh, he, was, he was our best source of knowledge. He was the one who pointed us in the direction as to where to go to find the species we were targeting. So this is, a, this is like you were looking for a walking shark? <laughs> yeah, so last year I did a Shark Week show called Island of the Walking Sharks, which is about um, these sharks in Papua New Guinea, these epaulet sharks, that have evolved the ability to actually leave the water and come out onto land for short periods of time and then dip back into tide pools to hunt for prey and escape predators. However, this had never been filmed in Papua New Guinea before. A close, a close cousin, a different species of epaulet had been filmed walking in Australia, but none of the three native species in Papua had ever been filmed exiting the water before. So we went there with this objective and after a very lengthy trip, we succeeded and were able to film the leopard epaulet, one of the three species, leaving the water on a full moon, extreme low tide to go and hunt for fish in a tide pool. And it was very, very cool. That's really cool. So what did this tribe in, in Papua New Guinea, did you stay with them for any amount of time? What did they eat? You said uh, fish protein. Yeah. So when we were there, uh, they, they made us drink this porridgey thing that I'm not really sure what it was, to be quite honest. It was uh, something that was mashed up and fermented coconut and some sort of it wasn't a grain though i can tell you that much it was like a fruit porridge um and it was quite revolting but we did drink a lot of it um and it was enjoyable because it was part of the you know just part of the ceremony and um and so they from so as far as how much time we spent with them we spent a day and a half with them it wasn't a lot of time yeah, yeah. so i'm not qualified to speak on what their general diet is but they had a lot of fruit around the village. They had plantains hanging, you know, that had been cut that were hanging from rafters, if you would, to ripen in the sun. And then they had salted fish, dried fish, fresh fish, uh, crocodile uh, that they had killed not too long ago. We, you know, we chose not to feature a lot of this, right? Because we're making shows for Discovery and Animal Planet. So you don't want to see a big dead gutted crocodile lying out. But um, they had a crocodile in which they were eating the meat from. And... Again, you know, and maybe this is my selective memory, but I don't remember any vegetables, no leafy greens, uh, no potato like things, um, you know, certainly no broccolis or anything like that. I don't remember any leafy vegetables and I didn't see any very old people there, but it was a pretty small community. It was a young community, too, like a lot of smaller children. The, mm -hmm. war the, the, the warriors in training were all there at the time, and apparently they go out for like long weeks at a time. And uh, these were like all these like little kids. And it's funny, I have a three-year-old, but I was looking at these kids that are like seven years old in their face paint and they're like not allowed to smile. It's like part of their culture. They're like not supposed to smile. So they're all like mean mugging you at seven and they're like got these sharp spears. And you're like, this, these guys are serious. Oh. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I don't know. I didn't see that. I saw them eating fish, crocodile and fruit, to be honest. Yeah. And were they generally healthy looking? In gen you extremely, know? extremely. Yeah. Again, everybody was lean. Everybody had six pack. You know, I think the thing is, Paul, like when we when we draw these parallels, these people were all very healthy, right? Healthy by Western standards. When we look at them and go, wow, like there's not a single obese person. I'm sure none of them have diabetes. You know, I'm sure none of them have some of these things that are that are based on refined processed sugars and foods and, you know, shit that we eat and and the stress of our lifestyle. They probably and again, this is probably have more parasites than we ever will, right? Because they're living, running around the jungle barefoot. They're eating raw fish out of rivers and creeks. And we'll never know it because they'll never be tested. But you right. know, I think they're, they don't have these, quote, genetic diseases that we have, right? Like they're healthy, 
because they're outside, they're lean because they're exercising all day long as part of their abilities to survive. They're not eating high fat foods, or if they are, it's animal fats. They're not eating a bunch of grain. They're not eating, they're certainly not eating any refined sugars. And, um, you know, their sicknesses come from other things. They come from exposure. They come from parasites. They come from infection because they don't have antibiotics and things like that. You know, if you get a cut in Papua New Guinea, uh, man, I should show you the spider bite I got. It's unbelievable. Like, and just because I picked at it with my dive knife and it got infected, I mean, my whole leg swelled up and I had this big abscess thing on it. You know, it's disgusting because it's such, you know, the ocean's so full of life and bacteria and things like that. So their sickness and their disease is not like ours. It's like environmental sickness, you know, and disease and parasites and things like that that they're dealing with. They don't have any of this like, oh, obese and, you know, uh, I can't even name all the things, but all these like, you know, hemorrhoids and shit like that that we get. That doesn't exist over there. They're not, they've never even heard of it. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I bet that I bet they I bet they poop easily and regularly and they probably sleep well and they don't have eczema and asthma and they probably yeah. don't get allergies. And I don't um, think so. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I it's it's such an interesting thing. And like I said earlier in the podcast, I just wish that more people in the medical field knew that there were humans that existed like this on the planet. It's such an interesting juxtaposition and study into what really might be causing all of these illnesses for us as humans and, and how we could get back to changing a lot of that. Uh, yeah, it's a fascinating, it's just and, such an interesting contradiction. Even, even growing up in Zimbabwe, so I had asthma as a kid, not very mild asthma, but I would get allergies and I'd be asthmatic and have to take an albuterol inhaler and stuff. I think I had to puff on the inhaler twice in my life. So it wasn't like a regular thing, but I still remember distinctly, I grew up on a farm in Zimbabwe having an asthma attack at like age nine or 10. And I had all these, these, you know, black friends that I grew up with uh, in Zimbabwe, Shauna people, they were from the Shauna tribe. And um, I pulled this thing out of my pocket and started huffing on it. Right. And it was again, the second or third time in my life I'd ever had to do it, but I carried it with me. I think I was going through a stint of it, you know, like this happens to kids where it's six months or a year or whatever, they have to carry the inhaler. And I remember all of my Shauna friends, Ludwig was one of them who said this to me. And he goes, what is that? And I was like, oh, it's this thing and I can't breathe and I get allergies. And he was like, you know, he was like that. I'm just going to say it. He was like, white people, you know, he was just like, he was like, you guys make this stuff up. He's like, you know, and I remember him like looking at me and explaining to me, he's like, Nobody of us have ever had anything like that. He's like, only you Westerners get these things. Like, we don't get these things. And it's true. You know, they didn't. They don't get those things. They absolutely, and they live a different lifestyle. This was on a farm in remote Zimbabwe, right? They lived in mud huts. They slept on the floor. Like, they live a different lifestyle. There was no issue with sleeping. There was no issue with anything. Everybody was very happy. And they don't get those things. They don't get asthma. They don't get allergies. Like, those things don't even exist for them. Yeah. How do you think, I guess you, you, you hinted, you alluded to it a little bit, but how is their, how was their lifestyle different than yours? I mean, they were, you were living on a farm. Were you eating different foods than they were? Were you exposed to different things? Cause they're yeah. very yeah. like, yeah, I'm just curious that that juxtaposition yeah, very, also. Very, very different, right? Like they were, they lived in their tribal way in their mud huts with their grass thatch roofs. And that was, you know, where they built their compounds, like their, their big communities. And I lived, you know, in my farmhouse with my family where we ate our meals that my mom had had and her mom had had. And, you know, that was a bit of everything. And keep in mind, this was like, you know, this was this was early 90s. Right. This was like before we understood. Like, I still remember like, uh, well, we didn't have the Western cereals, but basically, you know, Frosted Flakes was a healthy breakfast back then. <laughs> right. You know, there was no other information right like that was a good breakfast a part of a balanced breakfast they're great you know and yeah, so we, oh, would yeah. have, we would have frosted flakes because that was part of like our culture and they would have sadza and, and nyama or like sadza and rape so which is like basically like cornmeal and meat you know and that was what they were eating for breakfast and so it wasn't because you know i'd go and hang out with them and i'd have sadza and nyama and they'd come to my house and they'd have corn flakes and milk but you know, it was just completely different because we live different lifestyles uh, based on, you know, our, our backgrounds. And so, yeah, they they slept on the floor they were on a hard, you know, wooden bed and they worked outside. They went to school, but their school was different to my school. I went to like prep school, you know, and they fed us school lunches. And those lunches were usually full of sugar and fried food and blah, blah, blah. You know, all these just different cultures, you know, living, living together, but living, living differently. And so, yeah, they're just, they just didn't have any of these constructs that we have. It's just, it's so interesting to think like where, 
where along the continuum did we do we become harmed as humans? And where where along the continuum do we become ill as humans? Because I, um, though I'm not a huge advocate for humans eating grains, there certainly are indigenous cultures, not necessarily hunter gatherers, but there are indigenous people around the world who eat some grains and seem to enjoy pretty good health. So, and you know, when I was in Africa, I spent most of my time with the Hadza, who I know you visited, and they're they're pretty much pure hunter gatherers. They've been contacted by missionaries, and they eat some cornmeal, and they get some seed oils, but ninety five percent of their food, from what I observed, was animal meat, animal organs, fruit, honey, and that was basically it. Um, and then we went to another tribe nearby, the Datoga, who are like the the metalsmiths, and one of the Datoga men actually made an arrowhead out of a nail in five uh, minutes while we were watching. He's just pounding yep. this, this arrowhead into it. I actually have it behind me. Oh, cool. Yeah. This is actually the Datoga arrowhead that I have from, from Africa. Oh, and he, he made that. Arrow. Yeah. Fishing arrow, yeah. He made it out of a nail. Um, and, but the Datoga ate a lot of cornmeal, but they looked reasonably healthy as well. They, they were not obese. I, you know, I think you can make comparisons and this is sort of like modern day Western price stuff and say, well, versus Hadza, who knows? I don't have a, a roving medical clinic to look at their, all of their number, all their blood work and stuff. But, you know, it was interesting to me to see that, you know, they can eat some of their diet from cornmeal or a significant amount and actually not be that sick. It's, so somewhere beyond that, I think is where we go wrong as humans. And I wonder whether it's high fructose corn syrup. And I mean, I have a strong suspicion that seed oils are a major player just based on my observations. And mechanistic studies and other things I've talked about on other podcasts, but something in there. And then I think about what's different between the corn, the frosted flakes that you were eating and, you know, the, the meat and the grains that you're, that you're right. Sean and neighbors were eating. And I think, right. oh, there's a, there's a, this is the kind of thing I've been thinking about a lot more recently, like the processing of the corn and maybe right. the food dyes right. and the preservatives. I've been thinking a lot about like red dye number 40, you know, Allura red. It's in so many things. And you think, oh man, that's, this is, just these little things that get put into our foods and these, these food additives that we don't think about very often. It's right. just, you know, I think seed oils are bad. Yes. But then these food additives, I wonder if these food additives, you know, the, the, the yellow dyes, the red dyes, red 40, the carrageenan, the gums, this, this, this is kind of the epitome of what we think of when we say processed food gets all these little things yeah. added that the FDA in the United States says, Oh, they're completely fine. Like, you know, Red 40 is approved by the FDA, right. but it's, it's in, in animal models, it clearly causes irritable bowel syndrome, actually inflammatory bowel syndrome in animals, you know, right. the equivalent of ulcerative colitis or Crohn's. And yet FDA says it's safe. And you think, man, there's just, there's something different about what we're doing as Westernized humans versus what these simpler living humans are doing that I think is so insightful. And that's, I wish Western medicine was aware of that. I think, you know, and look, Paul, like I'm nowhere near as qualified as you and probably many of your listeners are to speak on this. Like my opinions are purely observational and anecdotal. That being said, when I eat a box of frosted flakes that came from the store, right? I don't know what's in it. I don't know the process that went into it. When, when my Shauna neighbors, the guys that I would run around barefoot on the farm with would eat mealy meal, cornmeal, sadza, as we call it in Zimbabwe, they would grow the corn right beside their house they would take the corn dry and take the kernels off when it was ripe not before it was ripe not not later they would hand dry it in the sun pick it themselves on these big sheets then they would take it and they'd put it in a thing and grind it themselves and then they'd add boiling water so what's in that what's in that mealy meal corn and water maybe a bit of salt right what's in my frosted flakes a whole bunch of stuff that i can't even name and when you look at it from 50,000 foot overview they're both corn products. This one just has sugar and this one just has salt. Well, no, they're, they're very, very different corn products, right down to the soil that they're grown in, the fertilizer that's put on them, and, and, and it goes on and on. Further to that, I think that I think that you can be perfectly healthy eating veggies and cornmeal and thing, and you might not agree with that if you're eating it in a very limited capacity, in a seasonal capacity, you're burning it off. It's a substitute for when other things aren't available, better things, more, more bio-rich, more, so excuse me, more nutrient bioavailable rich foods aren't available. It's not like any Shauna person would choose to eat sadza over a big juicy impala. They just wouldn't, right? If you get, if you put, if you're like, hey, steak or sadza, they're taking steak 100% of the time. I know this is a big generalization, 
but they are. They're just everybody wants steak. But when you get one Impala and you're a family of 35 or whatever, or a community of 35, well, you each get a bit of Impala and to substitute and get the sop up the sauces and enjoy that Impala to the best of your ability, you get a big dollop of, of sadza, you know? And so that way you make do and you share. But at the end of the day, everybody would love to just have more meat, right? They all, they all want it more. They all crave it more. Their bodies crave it more. Are they still healthy? Absolutely because they're burning it off, they're working, they're outside, there's no additives, there's no preservatives, but I don't think that it's anybody's choice. And ultimately, you know, the conservationist in me is like, it's great, we should eat more, you know, forage things and more, more fruits and veggies and things like that, especially when it comes to managing wildlife. But I don't think that it's the right choice for the human biome, right? I think humans want to eat these things that are very good for us, that are very nutrient dense, and so that we eat less of them as well. You know, I know when I'm eating more strictly, not that I'm ever truly carnivore, but eating more strictly carnivorous and eating lots of liver and, and organ meat and stuff like that, I'm far less hungry most of the time. And when I do decide like, ah, screw it, it's holidays, I'm going to have some cake and some donuts and a hot chocolate. I just want to, I'm like a hungry, hungry caterpillar. I just want to eat all day long. I don't care what you put in front of me. Yeah, I, I actually, I totally agree with you, Forrest. I see the the grains and the vegetables is like survival food. And I think most humans throughout our history probably ate those things when they couldn't get things that were more palatable or more desired. Right. But I, I think it's so interesting. And this is one thing I've tried to do in my work is to say, but from that, we can almost reverse engineer or just construct straight away a hierarchy of food value for humans. And it's not to say you only should eat the highest value foods all the time, but right. I think there is a pattern you know, um, based on what I've read and what I've observed in limited fashion, uh, that 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 humans do seem to prefer animal meat and organs and then sweet things that that in nature being fruit, honey, et cetera. Like those are the things we prefer. And yeah. and then, I mean, there's a great paper by Frank Marlowe, the guy that spent so much time with the Hadza, and he ranks, you know, what are the Hadza foods? And there's the foods are tubers, berries, honey, and, and meat. And I think yeah. there's a fifth one, but Oh, uh, Baobab. And, and, oh, yeah. and he asks both the men and the women what they prefer. And both the men and the women say honey is number one. Sure. For, the, for the men, it's meat is number two. But for the women, it's like a three-way tie between berries, uh, meat, and Baobab. And then uh -huh. for both the men and the women, tubers are like a distant fifth. And yeah. like vegetables beyond tubers are not even in the survey. They don't even say, oh, what about seeds? Or what about like right. leaves of the plant? That's like so far down for these people. And I just think it's so interesting that you walk into Whole Foods or whatever grocery store is near you, and the, the paradigm, this, this sort of hierarchy that I think is clearly demonstrated by humans throughout our history and, and anthropology is flipped on its head. And like yeah. all of the survival foods are, especially Whole Foods, because they sort of glorify the, the plant foods, totally. they're, they're saying, eat more of these survival foods. And I think, well, I mean, sure, if they don't bother you, eat them. But they're like what, what humans really want most of the time is like, meat, fish, you know, this kind of stuff. And that's, it seems to be the, the kind of stuff that you've observed in all of your travels as well. Yeah, I think, you know, outside of the United States and maybe the UK and Australia and a few places like that, where this agenda has been pushed in the media, people are honest and they prefer to eat good stuff and good stuff is meat, you know, and it's that simple. Like, yes, I'll eat some leaves if that's what's available. But if it's if I have my choice, I'm going to eat meat. And that doesn't mean that we're all healthy or all unhealthy or anything like that. It's just I want to eat meat and fish and these things when I can. And when I can't, I will eat these other survival foods to get by. And as long as I'm still burning a bunch of calories and outdoor and surviving, I'm going to do quite well. Now, I'll tell you the flip side of that, Paul, which is quite interesting. I, I, I was vegetarian for a month. Like I did it for a January, which is not very long. I know I felt absolutely horrendous while I was doing it. Um, this was years ago, five, six years ago now. And uh, I never, I always believed I need to eat more, uh, you know, broccolis and, and cauliflowers and more salads and things like that. And honestly, I won't say that I had irritable bowel syndrome, but my stomach was upset regularly, like, all, like at least a couple times a week. And I just didn't think anything of it. I thought the best way to combat that would be eat more veggies and be healthier. Right. And, and I was totally stuck in this. And until quite recently, when, you know, people like yourself and Brian Johnson and Joe Rogan and these people became popular in their message. And, you know, I was maybe a little bit ahead of the curve. But when I first decided to personally cut out 
cauliflowers and broccolis and, and kales and, you know, leafy greens. Oh my God. I was like, holy shit. I don't have a terrible digestive system. Like I just thought I had a weak, awful digestive system. And uh, the reason I tell you all that talking about the flip side of it. So I've, for the last like year, a couple of, probably like three years now, I've been very strict about, I eat a lot of fruit, a lot of meat, you know, every now and then I'll have a pasta dish or very rarely a salad, but you know, maybe some roast veggies with my steak or something like that, you know, every now and then, and it doesn't really bug me. I have a little bit of it here and there. I spent six weeks in India last year, uh, in November, October. I have never been sicker in my life. I just like, there's no meat available, right? So they eat a little bit of fish and a little bit of chicken here and there, but there's no red meat available. I took, um, I don't know if you've ever seen these things, these carnivore crisps. I just oh, have yeah, one yeah, on my yeah. desk. Those they're are great. fantastic. Yeah, they're really good. So I took a bunch of those with me, thank God. But all you could get is like curried potatoes and non breads and, you know, tikka this and eggplant that and all these things. And after two or three years of really limiting those in my diet, not cutting them out completely, but limiting them and then going to eating them almost exclusively for six weeks. I felt like I was going to die. I made a joke on my podcast on the wild times. I was like, the worst part about India is if you're walking down the street and you feel like you're going to sneeze, you don't know what end it's coming out of because it's just like you just the whole time I felt so bloated and just bad. And uh, I I just wonder if, if the Indian people feel like that all the time and don't know any better or, you know, I was really curious because there's, there's literally, you know, millions and millions of Indian people in India, 24 million in New Delhi alone. And they're pretty much all eating like this. And I'm just like, I'm like, I'm sorry for you guys. Like, it doesn't, it's not right. (laughs) You know, it's, it's, it's so true. I mean, when I was a raw vegan for about seven months, I had the same thing. I had a lot of diarrhea, a lot of gas. Yeah. And um, not to belabor the, the gross GI stuff, but I'll have the editors put in a clip here. So um, Rich Roll is a guy that I've, is a well-known plant-based advocate and, I actually did a podcast with him on The Minimalists many years ago. Okay. And, and we disagreed about a number of things, but there was a clip posted on social media recently on his podcast. He was talking to another doctor who's a huge advocate of plant based diets and fiber. And I mean, I'm kind of throwing Rich Roll under the bus here, but I'm, he's just he's saying this outright. So I'm just showing what Rich Roll is saying truthfully. Sure. Rich is saying that he poops six times a day. And okay. I think. <laughs> and he says, and he even admits in this clip that it's mostly kind of runny. It's like kind of loose and runny. And I'm thinking like, man, they're like a good formed poop is really nice. And a runny yeah. poop is not that great. It's just like, it's, it's hard to wipe. And it's just, it's no good. Like nobody wants to be walking around with their stomach hurting and bloating no. and farting all day. And for this well-known plant-based advocate, to say I poop four to six times a day to a guy that's celebrating fiber and the guy right. that's, you know, and then of course right. this like fiber doc is saying like, Oh, that's okay. And then rich goes, well, it's kind of runny most of the time and loose. And you're like, in what, in what universe do you not like the light bulb should go on, man. Like these, right. these wrong. plants. Yeah. yeah. And so that's, that's what I try to say with my messaging is look, if you're having amazing poops on vegetables and you don't have gas and bloating or irritable bowel syndrome, or inflammatory bowel syndrome, or fatigue, or or joint pain, then maybe vegetables are no big deal for you, or you're eating ones that don't disagree with you, and and you're cooking the heck out of them. And it's a great, you know, that's that's fine. But I think there's a lot of people out there who are having those issues, and they're like you, they're thinking, I'm just not eating enough fiber. Like there's some- That's 100% it. Like I gotta be healthier. I gotta eat more veggies, more of these things that are poisoning me. (laughs) Yeah. Like my gut flora, you know, this, this, this propaganda, like my gut flora just isn't diverse enough, which isn't true. I mean, fiber doesn't do this, but the, the messaging, if people are, are not super savvy, they'll think oh, my gut flora isn't healthy enough. I just need to eat more vegetables and I'll have solid poops. And it's like, how many vegetables do you need to eat? When Rich Roll, right. you know, right. has four to six times a day of like semi-diarrhea, like it's just, right. it's crazy to me. And so that's what I want people to understand because, um, I wonder if you'd gone to a doctor, Forrest, and said, hey, I'm having some like loose stool and diarrhea and all these things. Um, and, and the doctor, I don't think any doctor, I, I think very few doctors would have said, are you eating too many vegetables? Maybe you should cut back on the vegetables. Like no doctor ever says that. <laughs> no. And, and you know, here's the other thing, Paul. You and I, and maybe even your listeners, we might be the minority. 
You know what I mean? Because, and I don't want to take away from your message. So please, you know, I I don't mean to be insensitive, but like my wife can eat as many vets. She can eat salads, three meals a day, and she can have grilled veggies and blah, blah, blah. You know, it doesn't bug her one bit, not one bit, you know? And that's great, like good for her. But if I eat the same way she eats, I feel terrible. I'm lethargic in the gym. I'm bloated. I have soft stools and way too many bowel movements and all of that. And so, you know, maybe we're the minority, right? And I think that's one of the reasons that your message I love so much on social media, where you're like, if you're thriving, stick to it. You know, don't change what you're doing. That's great. And I I completely agree with that, right? I'm very open-minded with this whole diet thing. But I have only from trying to be a vegetarian, trying to be a vegan, being super healthy, doing tons of protein shakes and all of that when I'm working out all these different things that I've experimented with for myself only in the last couple of years when I'm like, it's really quite simple. I just have to eat some meat and fruit and I feel great. It's not that complicated. I, I want everybody to think that as well, but I, I know that it doesn't necessarily it like, it doesn't apply to my wife and I'm sure it doesn't apply to other people as well, where they can eat whatever they like and it doesn't bug them or certain things do and don't bug them so on and so forth. But you know, it's just, maybe everybody's just different in the way they process it based on your lineage, based on your bloodline, based on who knows what. But yeah, I know the whole the whole like carnivore leaning into the carnivore thing definitely works for me. I feel so much better. That's so that's awesome, dude. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to try and uh, maybe we'll get you. I'll send you with some some heart and soil organs because on these on these expeditions you're going on, I'll give you some like desiccated organs or something to take with you. So you've, I'll take it. Yeah, you've got them, you. you know, if you're uh, if you're out there. But uh, yeah, man, I, I would never tell your wife or any woman or man who says I've thrive on roasted vegetables and be like, great. Like, that's right. fantastic. You know, right. um, we're individual. And, you know, I think that I didn't always feel that way, but I, over time I've learned and softened and I, I've never been a proselytizer. I grew up in kind of a, I don't know, an overly religious situation. And, um, you know, I, I, I went to a Catholic high school and was part of a prayer group. I don't think many people know this about me. And so like, I've had my fill <laughs> of like preachiness and proselytization in my life. Like I don't sure. try to convert anyone. Like I'm, I just want to put information out there that, that is valuable to people if they want to pick it up. But if it, if they just want to leave it there and walk on and collect some other shells, that's, I'm fine with that too. It's just, I think that there's, there's a, there's a dearth of information that is counter to the mainstream out there right now. And like I said, I just don't think many doctors would, would see you as a patient and say, I think you're eating too many, too much broccoli, man. No I think way. you're eating too much. Uh, I think you're eating too much cauliflower rice and mashed cauliflower. Like lay off the cauliflower, bro. It just doesn't happen. And I think it I've helps. It. Yeah, it helps it. so many people. Yeah. Um, and, and in general, you know, I mean, I've seen all kinds of things resolve when people, and it's just anecdotes. It's just a sum event of ones and it'll be very right. hard to study formally. Um, but maybe we'll, we'll try and do it at some point. But I've just seen people resolve all sorts of things. And even for myself, I think, you know, I talked about this on a previous podcast with Georgie Dinkov. There's all these, those, all those little ingredients in food are important to note too. Um, you know, even like a little, I've had people say, and this is why I think a carnivore, an animal based or a carnivore diet. So just meat or meat and fruit and honey and organs, like a simple diet free of food that has additives and dyes. You hear this all the time. I hear it like my elbow pain got better. It's like, oh, that's interesting. And I've yeah, noticed for myself right. even that sometimes I'll introduce a new food in my diet. And, and I don't know exactly how that food is made. So there's a, there's a great producer here in Costa Rica that does raw goat's milk. And they, they deliver it to me uh, every, every couple of, like every three or four days. And it's great. And I got, the, I got a goat cheese from them and it's a block of cheese. And I don't really know how they make it. You know, I don't know what kind of rennet they use. I don't know if it's a vegetable rennet or an animal rennet to make this cheese. And I kind of, this is just my association in my brain. Like I thought, when I'm, when I'm eating this goat cheese, um, my, my hips hurt a little more when I'm sleeping. I sleep on my side at night and I have this, like, I have a very firm mattress. It's made completely of wool because oh, wow. I kind of want to, I kind of want to feel like I'm sleeping outdoors. Right. Oh, cool. Yeah. But I noticed like, is, am, am I eating this cheese and having my hips hurt a little more? It's just an association. So right. I'm just trying to do this detective work. And I want people to understand that like even a little thing like that, or an excipient, a talc or a silica or a, um, or a titanium dioxide in the supplement can sometimes trigger a little bit of something in someone and they get like a little elbow, you know, these like nagging yeah. injuries. So yeah. it's so interesting and so powerful, I think, to be really intentional with what we're putting in our diet and the devil's in the details to whatever degree people can do that. So 
Yeah, man. And, and to what your personal sensitivity is to these things. Yes. Like I, I only realized later in life that I was sensitive to, you know, cr- what it was it? Cruciferous? No, what's the word I'm looking for? Cruciferous? Uh, yeah. For, yeah, vegetables. You know, it took me took me 30 years of my life to figure that out, that I was sensitive to it. And I always thought the remedy was to eat more of it, you know, and it, it, I'm, I am just sensitive to it. You know, if I'm eating a high vegetable diet, I feel like shit. I went to a barbecue on Saturday at one of my best friend's house. And the first thing we had, you know, we had, we had tri-tip, which is a California cut of meat, but we had big, you know, piece of tri-tip. And then we had this awesome salad that was like kale and a bunch of other stuff. And I had a big serving of both. That was the worst I've felt in three weeks, you know, and I know it wasn't from the tri-tip because I can eat tri-tip seven days a week and I feel great. And I was just like, why do I do this to myself? So, yeah, I mean, it's just those those personal sensitivities. And, uh, you know, I don't know. I know there's like blood tests for food allergies and stuff like that. I don't know how many of those are accurate or reveal the right stuff. It's like you just so have hard. to try stuff, you know, you yeah. just got to try it and try cutting out stuff. And like it really took you know, reading your book, following some of these messages, talking to Joe, the, you know, three, four years ago, last time I, I saw Joe, I think it was like three years ago, he was on the carnivore diet. I was like, what's that? You're a lunatic. And they told me about it. And I was like, yeah, all right, I'll try it. And uh, it was like, I felt great. And I was like, this is crazy. Like nobody, nobody's talking about this until, you know, stumbling onto people like yourself. Red meat's going to kill you, but until it kills you, you're going to feel really good. <laughs> like, yeah, totally. <laughs> like, and humans all over the world don't really give a shit about vegetables, but they're the best thing in the world for you. And the red meat, that, you know, or like meat that everybody wants all over the world and the organs that people treasure, those are not so good for you. Don't eat those. It's just such a such an interesting clarification. So how did that become a thing, Paul? I'm sure you've gone over this a million times for your listeners, but if you could sum it up, how did we, when did we flip that narrative where it was like, hey, these things are bad? What happened in our world? Is it is it because we started having hamburgers and frying them in greasy vegetable oil? Like what happened where we just went, hey, meat's bad all of a sudden? I think that um, Nina Teicholz has done a really good job with this in her book, The Big Fat Surprise. I'm going to have her back on the podcast soon. Okay. But there's some history, and it's probably right around 1950 after World War II. Because if you go back to the early 1900s, I mean, you know, our great-grandparents, I mean, your great-grandparents might have been in, in Zimbabwe, but my great-grandparents were New York, you know, you know, in the United States or New Jersey. And, uh, you know, all the animal, all the fat that we ate was from animals. There were no seed oils before 1911. I mean, cotton seed oil in the 1860s, 1870s, but Crisco 1911 was the first time we had seed oils. But, you know, that's just one piece of the equation. But early 1900s, all the fat we ate was tallow and lard, probably from pigs that are raised way better than they're raised today, and butter. That was all the animal fat that we got. And we ate meat when we could get it. Like if you could afford meat in the early 1900s and the Great Depression, World War I, World War II, you ate that meat. And right. people ate a lot less vegetables. I mean, broccoli and kale are just like inventions in the last few decades. You know, people ate potatoes, I think, you know, but if you look at the menus from the early 1900s, they're very different than we have today. It's a few carbs, quote unquote, of like a potato and, and meat. But like, that's where the saying meat and potatoes came from. And then somewhere around the 1950s, I think it was Eisenhower uh, had a heart attack and there was a whole storm around like the narrative and, you know, like we're going to blame this on saturated fat. And then Ansel Keys comes in and does the seven country studies, which is totally um, just looks at seven countries in the world where they could correlate saturated fat intake and heart disease and leaves out the other 16 studies, uh, the other 16 countries where there was no association between saturated fat consumption and heart disease. So it was like this epidemiology, uh, you know, sleight of hand voodoo. And, and then there was, you know, the American Heart Association <laughs> received a huge grant, the equivalent of like 20 million plus dollars oh, wow. um, in 1951 or something from, uh, it was one of the food companies. Um, it was Procter & Gamble. So Procter & Gamble gave the American Heart Association, I think it was 1 million or $1.5 million dollars in 1950, which is the equivalent of $20 million today. And, and then somehow, you know, like, who knows, you know, the American Heart Association and Ansel Keys, and then the narrative completely flips on its head and says saturated fat is bad, and that's butter and milk and animal fat, and polyunsaturated fat is good. Where's that? Well, it's Crisco and corn oil. And you see these ads from the 1950s and 1960s, you know, Mazzola your family, you know, Right. Polyunsaturate your family. We can find some of those and put them in the YouTube video. 
Like there's a, there's literally an ad. It's gotta be 1950s, 1960s of a woman saying like, tonight I poly unsaturated my family. <laughs> it's so freaking crazy, dude. So I think that that has been the narrative since the 1950s and it's all tied into the seed oils and the saturated fat. And then around that is like, you know, the vegetables too. And I don't, I mean, vegetables are not the worst thing in the world, but um, it's been this sort of slow twisting of the narrative, certainly away from saturated fat. Right. And then you're away from animals. And then where do you have to go? You go to plants. And then it's like, oh, well, if you're not going to eat animals, what are you going to eat? The only thing left to eat is plants. And then we get the food pyramid yeah. with uh, six servings of grains per day or more. I think it's, you know, and, and, and like only a few, like they, I forget it's six or 12 per day. And, you know, some of those are whole grains, but some of them are not even whole grains. Like we're being told to eat massive amounts of grains in our diets because what else is left? I mean, they've told us that red meat is bad for us. Saturated fat is bad for us. You can eat a little, little lean chicken and some salmon, but don't, don't, there's nothing else left. So where are humans going to get their calories? Right. So it's just, I think most of it had to do with that sort of saturated fat versus polyunsaturated fat argument. And then it gets really complicated when you start looking at the lipids, because then the lipid hypothesis gets tied into this and the idea that LDL cholesterol uh, is, is bad for humans or is directly injurious to the endothelium. And that's a whole separate podcast that I've done because what we find is that if you eat more saturated fat from animals and less polyunsaturated fat from seed oils or whatever, your LDL often rises 20%. 15, 20%. Oh, and if you eat more of the polyunsaturated fats, your LDL goes down. So there were famous studies done in the 1960s, the Minnesota coronary study, where they had two groups of people and they were, they were mental health institution patients. And they fed one of them burgers that were full of saturated fat and one of them burgers that were full of seed oils. I think it was soybean oil. And it was like 9,000 participants. And Ansel Keys was one of the people doing this study. So the guy who was kind of at the center of this transition and his name didn't end up on the study. And the full study was never published until like 2013 by Chris Ramsden when he went into the basement of the grandson of wow. one of the original researchers and found the original data. But what happened was that in the people that had the seed oils in their diet, their LDL went down, but they died from cardiovascular disease more. And there was actually an increased morbidity so they huh. died earlier, they died sooner, and they had no protection from a cardiovascular perspective, but their LDL went down. And huh. now we know that the, the, L, the whole lipid thing is more complex than just LDL. We can take the LDL and we can say, well, how much of the LDL is oxidized? How many of those phospholipids on the LDL? And then there's another subfraction of LDL called LD, uh, LP little a with an, you know, a lipoprotein little a on the apolipoprotein, the apolipoprotein on the LDL molecule. It's kind of like a mop. It kind of mops up... Uh, oxidized phospholipids. And so what we know, the whole story or more of the story now is that if you eat more saturated fat and less polyunsaturated fat, your LDL may go up, but your oxidized LDL and LP little a go down. And the latter two markers are much better predictors of cardiovascular disease. So it's all wrapped up and I'm, I apologize for the long-winded no, explanation, but it's this, it's it's this really complex, really like yeah. it's this complex interplay of what we consider to be healthy for the heart, cholesterol, right. you know, LDL going up, the AHA potentially getting paid off. It's just really strange. And now we're at this position of trying to kind of deprogram people or say, hey, look, like this doesn't make any sense. Like there's right. no, the Hadza or these people in Papua New Guinea or, you know, these Colombians are not saying, I can't eat that animal fat. That's too much saturated fat for me. My LDL is going to go up. <laughs> But I mean, I'm sure it's the same with anything, right? Again, you're talking about the Hadza and the Papuans and things like that. When they kill an animal, they're, they have a finite amount of that fat available, right? If I decided I wanted to eat bacon and pork belly and, you know, beef ribs three meals a day, I'm sure I'd be obese and very fucking unhealthy, right? Because that is just <laughs> fat. But though I'm saying- Maybe not. Sorry, you let, might me, be surprised. Sorry let, let me restate that. If I decided to eat like that and not be active and not go outside, and I chose to eat more fat than just uh, muscle tissue and organ tissue, and pretty much just made my diet animal fat, I'm sure that excess would be unhealthy too. Maybe I wouldn't be obese. I don't know. But I'm sure I wouldn't feel very good if I was just eating massive amounts of animal fat yeah. and not other things, not protein, like lean protein for that to bind to in my digestive system and things like that. 
So it's probably the same as anything, you know? I'm sure if I smoked a pack of cigarettes and ate bacon all day long, I'd feel terrible, you know? So it's like, what, what, sorry, which president was it that you said that died of the heart attack? I think it was, I don't think he died of it, but he had a heart attack. It was Eisenhower. I'm pretty right. sure it was Eisenhower. Yeah. And he had what a heart Eisenhower's attack. Eisenhower's daily routine, you know? He yeah, yeah, oh yeah. A pack of cigarettes, drinking a bunch of wine, eating shit tons of animal fats. You know, I'm not saying those are bad, but when you compound that with no exercise, you're eating so much animal fat versus like, oh, yeah, I'm eating fat with the meat. You know, it's like I think that it's just like everything in excess can kill you. Right. I don't care if it's broccoli or animal fat or cigarettes or whatever it is. Anything in massive excess can kill you. Yeah, I think there's a balance. And the thing is that by 1950s, the seed oils had made a, a big inroads in the population and you can see the shift in choices. So the underlying hypothesis would there would be how many families were now cooking with Crisco and Mazzola and corn oil. Right. And who knows what Eisenhower was cooking with or what the chefs were using in the kitchens. But right. I'm pretty sure by the 1950s, like they were not using as much butter and they were using more seed oils. And it's just all speculation and trying to reconstruct it. But it's super interesting stuff. But yeah, yeah. it's a great question. Thank you so much for asking that. No, but, it's like, yeah. how did that narrative flip? I mean, so where I grew up going back to Zimbabwe, you know, we were farmers, right, in Zimbabwe. And, and farmers, they ate steak and eggs for breakfast steak sandwiches or steak pies for lunch and a steak for dinner, right? And that was like how Zimbabwean farmers grew up. It's also, if you look at the Springboks rugby team, right? Half of them are, are Zimbabwean farmers, maybe not half anymore, maybe a third. And there is no such thing as obesity where I come from, not among any of the population, you know, and we eat tons of meat, tons of animal fats, all of it, but the lifestyle is much healthier. These are farmers. We're outside all day long and you're working with your hands and so on and so forth. So, you know, it's like, I I don't have any conclusions drawn to it. I'm not studied in it like you are, but I sure know it's pretty simple for me. If I eat a bunch of steak and eat a bunch of liver and nutrient dense uh, animal foods, I feel great. If I eat a bunch of veggies and try and be quote <laughs> healthy, I feel terrible. It's it's such an interesting experiment. That's what I just want people to do is be curious and explore and not be afraid of the red meat and understand yeah. that the red meat doesn't look like it's going to kill you and the vegetables may not be great for everyone. So uh, yeah, and I do want to point this out, you know, especially if any of the people that you know follow what I do listen. I had like a, a minor ethical dilemma with this in the beginning because, as a conservationist, I've always, been, you know, and a wildlife biologist, I've always had this agenda push that like don't eat cows, right? Like that's bad for the environment and that's bad for the world. And for a lot of, I won't say for the most part, but to a big degree, that can be true. OK, now you can make choices to eat sustainably. You can make choices to eat grass fed, pasture raised, so on and so forth. And you can, you know, look at places like White Oak Farms and certain places like this that do this all in a very ecologically friendly, sustainable, circular way where they're using the cows to fertilize the crops and the crops to feed the cows and in these closed systems. And so, you know, I think the majority of people, especially like my fan base that might listen to this and listen to might be shocked to hear that I am such a proponent for red meat and consuming red meat. I'm not saying go and eat a bunch of bush meat and go and poach endangered species and shove them in your mouth or go to McDonald's and eat a bunch of cheap, shitty beef, because I think both of those are terrible, terrible things. And I just want to be clear on that. I think if you choose to eat this way that Paul eats very, very, you know, very, very well seasoned. And I try to, but I'm not as strict. you got to make good choices because you can be very unhealthy doing that. Getting a McDonald's or a Jack in the Box or whatever, you might as well go eat a donut, you know, in my opinion. Obviously, one of those two things is slightly better for you, but like you can make poor choices for your health and poor choices for the environment. You can also make good choices for your health and good choices for the environment whether that's carnivore or vegetarian or anything else. There are ways through the woods to do all of it. And I think that's yeah. important for people to realize. Absolutely. I think that the quality of the food you eat is, is, is really important. It's just, it's paramount. And like you said, there are so many good farms out there. White Oak. I had Will Harris on the podcast actually last week from White Oak oh, Pastures. Oh, the guy from White Oak? Oh, that's yeah, really yeah, cool. Yeah, that's really yeah he's, you would love him. But yeah, yeah just, there's so many good farms out there now and hopefully more people will be aware of that. So I have a freezer full of their stuff like right on the other side of this wall. <laughs> yeah, I love the White Oak stuff. It's They're so cool. Good. They're yeah, so cool. That's amazing. Small. Where can people find more of your stuff? You've got a podcast? 
Yeah, so we have a podcast called The Wild Times Podcast, which is mostly like comedy and wildlife related stuff. It's very fun. It's me and two, two of my buddies. And then, uh, you know, all the regular social media stuff. And then I, I do a lot of shows on Discovery Channel, Shark Week every year. I've got a bunch of seasons of shows, Extinct or Alive, Mysterious Creatures, blah, 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 blah. The list goes on. So you can sort of just look up my name and find me anywhere, all the regular places. Thank you so much for spending time for us. It's a pleasure. And like we said, I hope that you and I get to go on adventure in the near future. When you get back from this expedition, I'm going to try and we'll, we'll try and figure something out. I want to go on some adventures with you, man. I would love to, Paul. It would be so eye-opening to see it through your lens when looking at tribes and cultures and people. Because I just look at it like, hey, where are the critters I'm after? But to actually see you take it in from that, you know, from that nutritional standpoint and, and the longevity standpoint would be fascinating for me. Well, I would love to have somebody near me, you know, who's into the wildlife biology and can help me with that side of it too. So it'd be super fun. But thanks again, brother. Thanks, bud. Good to see you.